I will have to say that I do enjoy these images from the great brother Ken. He is the original Dr. Johnny Fever out there in Salina, Kansas. Home of shenanigans. Welcome to Build, Grow, and Enjoy this week. We have got a tremendous guest coming with us here in a few moments. The great Stanley Wise leader is going to be with us. Go ahead and get a hold of us online at buildgrownandenjoy.com. B-G-E. Also find us on the Twitter machine. It's Build, Grown, and Enjoy this week with Stanley Wise leader, the dogs of Brownsville. He will join us here in just a few seconds. And uh, we are going to call him on the old telephone. The old traditional telephone, as they say. I don't know who's saying it. I don't know why they're saying it. But they are indeed saying it. And I believe we will have our guest here in just a few seconds. I'm here. There you are. How are you, my friend? <laughs> Waiting patiently yes. to talk to you. Yes, indeed. I am very excited to talk to you about all your different projects. Uh, first of all, bring us up to speed on, on your latest, my friend. You're getting a lot of great and rave reviews, my man. Uh, yeah, that's the Dogs of Brownsville. Yes. Uh, it's a long time in coming, but, it, but it's finally here, and... Uh, like you said, I'm getting excellent uh, feedbacks. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this book. Uh, you put this book together. You've gotten, uh, you, you, you spent, uh, as they say, a yeoman's journey trying to uh, get this book put together. What, what, was, um, what was the original idea behind this? Well, <laughs> it's funny you ask. The original idea was just to tell a short Story. Mind you, a short story about guys playing stickball in the schoolyard. Okay. And then it, uh, as I'm doing my notes, it just seemed to grow out. It, it, it just expanded and grew and grew. And then before you knew it, it, it developed into a uh, 50-year saga. Wow. And uh, I have to <laughs> tell you, uh, I had a great amount of pleasure writing this book if if no one else liked it <laughs> i was still happy be, because i was able to put it down in writing and uh, have it for people to look at and uh, enjoy a good story i wasn't trying to get a message across or anything like that i just wanted to tell a good story and entertain people and uh, i think i've achieved it that's awesome. But That's... like I said, it was just an idea just to do a short story. And then before you knew it, it just grew and grew and grew. And I have to tell you, just about everything in it happened. It's, it, it's all true. Maybe not in the, in the sequence that I put it or with the same characters, but whatever happened in the book happened in real life. Wow. And. When people ask me, is it all true, I kid around and I say, well, it's all true except for the parts that I made up. Ha <laughs> ha, so yes! The, the only parts that I did make up was how to connect each incident one to the other. That was a daunting task because uh, when I first started to really write it, I said to myself, well, you know what? We have to have an outline. We really need an outline, otherwise it's going to be impossible. So as I'm working, to, the outline took me about six months to write. It was a 50-page outline, roughly one page per chapter. And then when I started to write from the outline, it flowed by itself. It, it, it almost wrote itself, and it took about... It took about a year and a half to write it from the outline, approximately a year and a half. That sounds like, well, that's not really writing itself, but trust me, 475 pages, <laughs> if 
I didn't have a good outline, I never would have been able to write this book. That is and the amount of research. I did a lot of research. Yes, yes. Putting this book together, the amount of research and articles from the newspapers and magazines was almost a foot high. Wow! Because a lot of the incidents, <laughs> you know, I took from real life. That's awesome. That's what awesome. Happened? Yeah, what was it like to really live in Brownsville in Brooklyn? I think I've uh, I think I've achieved that. That one one person sent me an email saying that uh, he he was never in New York City, but he walked away getting a good sense of what it was like to be living in Brownsville at at that time during those years. Awesome. So to me, that was a nice commendation, since that person had never even gone to to New York City, but uh, he he liked the he liked the book and the way I described the characters. That's tremendous. That is tremendous. We have got a great guest joining us this week here on Build, Grow, and Enjoy. The great Stanley Wise leader is with us. The Dogs of Brownsville is the latest from him, and uh, it is a tremendous book. You mentioned the research process. Give me a little bit more details yeah. on this, Stanley. Well, uh, <laughs> there was a... There was a fam give me an idea of some of the research. There was a family that lived around around the corner from where I lived in Brownsville. And uh, it was a black family because uh, that the neighborhood was highly integrated. I mean really, truly. And there was a black family that lived around the corner and one of the kids in that family became a uh, a thief and he would rob different grocery stores in the neighborhood and he almost robbed my father's store <laughs> but my father sensed who it was and he was able to de defuse the situation before it got out of hand but anyway uh, he was referred to as the great juice bandit and i used that in my book and i thought it would be really uh realistic to include something like that that really happened because this kid while he, well he wasn't a kid he was like maybe in his late teens early 20s and he was cleaning his handgun one night after he did his thing with the different stores and he forgot or didn't really realize that the gun was loaded and of course it went off and killed his younger sister so oh, that wow. really happened and while I was writing it, my assistant was able to catch or dig out and get the real story that was in the New York Daily News back at that time. So here I am writing about some, something from memory, and my assistant comes up with the actual article from the New York Daily News. And she says to me, hey, here's your story, word for word, just the way you just the way you described it. So I use things like that wherever I can to just get reality. I, want, I wanted reality more than anything while telling this story. And that's what I did. And I researched it like up and down. Like everything was thoroughly researched. Names, places, dates. And of course I had to change the names many times to uh, to protect the guilty. <laughs> so what That's I did awesome. was, if I was writing something favorable about somebody, I would use the real name in the book. But if I was writing anything derogatory or uh, something that that they would not appreciate, I of course used uh, an alias or made up a name or, or made up a whole new character where I took a number of events and ascribed all of them to one person. So each of my characters was a composite of two, three, four, maybe even five or six different people. And even then, I still had a lot of people in the book. So I did something that a lot of other, which I, well, I've never seen this done before. At the end of the book, I have a almost six pages 
describing what it was like living in Brownsville, not about the story, but about just everyday life in Brownsville. And I also included a chronology of characters, because I have so many people in this book. So I have the name of each major character, when they appeared in the book, which chapter on what page, and what their approximate age was during the telling of the story. I find it very handy when I want to look up something. Uh, like, uh, uh, like, for instance, uh, Yetta, who becomes Sally, and she runs a bordello or bunny ranch in Nevada where it's legal. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, I have her character as Mustang Sally, uh, originally, she was a rabbi's wife, and, well, I'm not going to give away too much of that story, what happened, Yes, but that, too, is based on reality. There was a family like that when I was growing up in Brownsville, where the spouse of a venerated rabbi did stray and uh, <laughs> commit the, the unthinkable. So, like I said... Again, everything in the book happened, and it was my job to hook all of the, these incidents together and make it into a viable story that flowed easily from one end to the other. And uh, I think I've done it because w one person said he read the book three times. <laughs> three times, wow. You know, he must have liked it, I guess. And also... Curiously, uh, I've gotten very favorable feedback from females, more than males. You would, you, you would think that maybe I wouldn't because of all of the uh, all of the shenanigans that take place in the story, uh, the connections with the mafia and so forth, and Las Vegas the way it used to be, and now what it became eventually. It's no longer what it used to be. Totally changed. In fact, when you ask people, anybody who knows Las Vegas, and you say to them, did you like Las Vegas the way it was, or do you like it more the way it is now? And I have to tell you, 100% of the people, they all say they liked Las Vegas better, much better the way it used to be, as opposed to the way it is now. Go figure, right? Hey, I'll tell you, I, I love Vegas, period. <laughs> I don't, you yeah, know, but, as, as, soon as, as soon as Joe Biden gives me my house, I'm moving to Vegas. So, uh, <laughs> well, when are you coming here? We have to meet up in person. Oh, you know, you know what is funny about that, Stan, is, um, Every year, well, except for this last year, except for except for this January, but every January I am out there covering the Adult Video News Awards at the Hard Rock Hotel, and um, I would love the next time that I am in town, which may be this summer, um, <laughs> I would love to get together with you, my friend, because I think that would be a... Uh, that would be a oh, trip. You got a deal. You just let me know when you'll be coming. Yes. And I'll make sure I'm oh, down. I, I, I will, I, I will do it, my man. And um, Stanley Wise Leader with us today. He joins us live. The Dogs of Brownsville is the latest from our good friend, Mr. Stanley. And uh, so this book, you, you put a lot of time and effort into the book. Yeah, talk to us a little bit about the the uh, the production process. Well, once this was all written. Uh, what did you do with it? Did, did you run it through an editor? Did you edit it yourself? How, how did this all work? No, no, no. I, I, I had it professionally edited twice. Uh, once for story content and continuity, the way it flows, and then also for grammar and punctuation and things like that. And you know what? A, a couple of mistakes still crept through. Because no matter how many times you proof, proof it, you'll miss something. So even though I had it professionally edited twice, 
there's still some errors in there. Uh, they're very, very few because we caught most of them. But I tell you, even you know, no matter what book you pick up, no matter where it was published, and you start reading, you'll find something, a word or something. It, it's, it's inevitable. You can't help it. So even though I had it edited, there's still something that creeps in. But then again, uh, some people, that you don't even notice it. Yeah. Because when you're reading, when you're going over the dialogue, sometimes your thought runs in conjunction with the dialogue, and you know you're reading something, and it's wrong, but you're still reading it the way I intended it to be. Because That's awesome. Because of the flow of the words. That's great. So if you're going to edit it again, you have to take it apart one word at a time, and that's practically impossible. We have got... And I have to tell you, yes, it's a lot Stan. of fun writing this book. It is Stan Wiseleader. He's with us today here on the broadcast. It is Build, Grow, and Enjoy, BGE Radio out of Atlanta, GA. And the fantastic Stanley Wiseleader joins us today here on our broadcast. The Dogs of Brownsville is his incredible, incredible book. Talk to me about the cover of this book, Stan. The cover is an image of some kids, of two kids playing uh, stickball between a, between a building and a lot where a building was torn down. In other words, a vacant space in between two buildings, and they're just playing stickball. Back in those days, you know, we didn't have places where to play or fields. You know, most of the playing was done in the street, in the street, and you had to watch out for cars. Every time a car would come, you know, we would curse at them or throw rocks at them or something. <laughs> they were interrupting the game. That's awesome. That is awesome. You know, I am... Um... I, I years and years uh, when 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 I was a little kid, you know, we we, we would we would play the uh, play basketball or whatever in 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 the streets, and uh, that was always that was always the thing. You either you either flipped them off or you uh, you threw rocks at the car. Yes, I uh, <laughs> I remember those days, baby. I remember those days. Now now, Stan, well, I remember. Go ahead, go ahead, my man. I remember one winter specifically. We were throwing snowballs at passing cars, okay? <laughs> ah, yes. A, a friend of mine, he threw a snowball that went through the, through the window of the car because he had his window down and hit the guy in the face. And he came back rushing at us. And I, my, my friend who threw the ball was standing there as, as though he didn't do anything. And I was in the process process of making a new snowball so he so, thought i was the one who hit him in the face with the snowball and he kept chasing after me so i ran like hell <laughs> that's great that is tremendous it is stanley wiseleader he's with us today here and during on... the summertime yes go ahead my during man. the summertime we would open up the fire hydrants to uh, make sprinkler systems out of them. You know, we didn't have anywhere to go swimming. Uh, the beach was too far away. We didn't have means of transportation, but it was hot. So what do you do? You have to open up the fire hydrant and let out some water. And how do you get the water to spray up in the air? You get an empty milk crate, and you put it on, on the nozzle that's shooting out the water, and you face up the crate so it makes the water go up, and uh, <laughs> whenever a car would come by, as soon as he was in range, we would raise the milk crate and get the car totally soused, wet, drenched with water. And if it was a convertible or a, a car with the windows open, <laughs> they didn't like it, and it would come screaming at us. That one time the police came, and they wanted to know who had the wrench to open it up. And I just played dumb. And I had the wrench hidden in my shoe, which was off to the side. So they never found out it was me. And as soon as I put my pants back on, I picked up my shoes, and I just simply walked away. 
and they never knew that I was the one who opened up the fire hydrant. That's awesome. So that's what it was like back in those days. And I have to tell you, tell you uh, the experience was worth a million. Would I do it again? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. That you is know, great. Surviving it is one thing, and telling about it is something else. Yes. So I'm glad that I survived and uh, glad that I'm able to tell about it. But there were a lot of people who uh, never survived, didn't make it out for whatever reason. They just fell in the cracks or slipped through or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It is a uh, great guest with us today. Stan Wiseleader is with us. He joins us live here on Build, Grow, and Enjoy, the BGE Radio Network out of Atlanta, GA. It is a tremendous topic today, the Dogs of Brownsville. So um, how would you compare this book to some of the other uh, books that are, that are kind of in this genre? I haven't seen one book yet, and I know of no book that tells this particular story about Brooklyn or Brownsville in particular. I don't think there's any book around that covers what I cover, starting out in the slums and making it to Las Vegas. I know there are a lot of people that have done it, but I cannot think of one book that tells about it. That's awesome. So as far as I know, it's the, this is the only one. Yeah. And it tells how it was back in the old days, how Howard Hughes came into, uh, into power. At one time, if you just mentioned the name Howard Hughes, it, it was all over Las Vegas. Back, back, that was back in the day when he owned or controlled 13% of the gambling in the entire state of Nevada. So you had the mob. Howard Hughes came along. He was responsible for the mob getting out of Las Vegas. And then all of a sudden, before you knew it, it was corporations that came in and took over everything. And uh, that's why Las Vegas is not what it used to be. And I have to tell you, everybody who I've spoken to, they preferred Las Vegas the way it was run by the mob instead of corporate America. <laughs> Isn't that just crazy, the, what, the, the world we and, live uh, in? I, I think I agree with them because corporate America, all they want to do is make money, make money, make money. Every aspect of Las Vegas has to make money. Yes. The parking lot has to make money. In yes. Fact, you know... A couple of years ago, they instituted parking fees for parking. It used to be for free. Now you have to pay for parking at all of the major hotels. It's an insult. <laughs> I don't even go to those hotels because you have to pay for parking. That's insanity. Yeah, a lot of the uh, – I've noticed over the years that you, you, you have very few casinos, very few places that you can go where, where you can uh, get away with uh, not having to pay for parking. Well, the big hotels charge for parking. The lesser ones don't because they still need the customers to come in and uh, play their games there. Yeah. But the, even the uh, the pool has to sh show a pro profit with the, uh, to the cabanas and the spas and the massages. That has to show a profit, too. Everything has to show a profit now. Every facet of the operation of a major hotel, and there are a number of them, has to show a profit. And if it doesn't, they up it or they fire somebody. Yeah. In the old days, it was the gambling that funded everything else. So it didn't matter if one aspect of the operation was unprofitable. They made it up with the gambling. But corporate America, that's not enough for them. Every aspect of the operation of the business of the hotel casino has to show a profit. So it's not like it used to be. It's still good. 
Oh, another thing, too, they've raised the prices tremendously on big-name acts at the various hotels. Oh, yeah. It used to be maybe 25 bucks was the, the high that you would pay to get in to see somebody, and you would get a show with it. I remember seeing, well, this is a long time ago. <laughs> I remember seeing the Paul Anka show. Paul Anka, and baby. With, there and he you is. got it with a dinner. It came with a dinner, Paul and it cost Anka. 15 bucks. the That's whole thing. That's awesome. Now you couldn't even get that for 300 bucks. You got to love Paul Anka. That's great. So everything has changed. Thank you to corporate America. Yeah, it's it is it is uh it is interesting, you know, like the uh, the last time that we were in Vegas, uh they were changing the Hard Rock Hotel Casino over to the uh Virgin uh Casino. And uh the the Virgin Hotels and uh I I you know, I, I don't know how that's going due to the fact that there's there's hey, Jim, been a it, it's called it's called progress. <laughs> what I think is funny is that they it, they're holding the porn convention at the Virgin Motel. That that that's <laughs> what I think is hilarious. But uh, we have got a tremendous tremendous guest with us today. He joins us live here. On our big program, uh, Build, Grow, and Enjoy this week with Stanley Wise later. And uh, so, Stanley, are you planning on writing another book or, or anything like this? Well, I'm in the process, actually. <laughs> I can't tell you what it's about. Okay. But I'm in the process of writing a couple of things. I want to keep it under wraps for now. And also, a lot of my time i'm spending now trying to get some publicity of for the dogs of brownsville because you can have a great book but unless you publicize it properly and let you, unless you get out there and you know sell it it's not going to sell by itself so right now i'm working on that it's in addition to writing other things you always have to write you have to keep doing that all the time people People ask me, what is it like? I said, hey, listen, if you go to the gym every day, you're going to get big muscles, right? Yes. If you write something every day, no matter what it is, you're going to get better as a writer. So you have to keep writing all the time. And what I do, if I get stuck on a project, and believe me, it's very easy to get stuck on a project. You put it aside, and you go to a different writing project. Now, that's not the way they teach it in school, but no. I find that it works for me because, you know, writers always get stuck. They call it, they always they have different names for it, but basically, is, basically what it is, you run out of ideas, okay? It yes. happens. It happens all the time. So you put aside, let's say, I'm writing on the dogs of Brownsville, and I'm stuck. I put it aside and go to something else and then maybe come back to the dogs a week or two later. So it's just being flexible and it lets you take on more projects at the same time. And hopefully you get done with some of them <laughs> while you're still around to appreciate it. That's awesome. That's awesome. It is a tremendous guest with us today. Stan Wiseleader is with us, and uh, Stan, before we let you go, my man, how do we get in touch with you online, buy your book, and everything else? Well, uh, my email address is very simple. It's stan at infinityx.us, S-T-A-N at I-N-F-I-N-I-T-Y-X. Dot us and 